superconductors are a phenomenon of quantum physics. When a superconductor is cooled below a certain temperature, it dramatically loses all electrical resistance. This is one of the things that makes superconductors different from regular conductors. Regular conductors are things like copper, silver, or aluminum. They are used to pass the flow of electricity. In these conductors, electron, which is a negatively charged particle of an atom, and these electrons are bumping into each other, going different directions, and getting lost along the way. This is known as electrical resistance, when the electrons encounter a hindrance to their movement. This can be a problem for just about anything that uses electricity. Modern power lines use thick cables and a high voltage to reduce electrical resistance. But even then, most of the energy being transported is wasted. However, inside superconductors, there is virtually no resistance. This means superconductors can conduct electricity perfectly. All the electrons move together in the same direction. In 1911, superconductivity was first observed in mercury by Dutch physicist Heike Kimmerlin Wunz of the Leiden University. When he cooled the mercury to the temperature of liquid helium, which is around negative 452 Fahrenheit, he noticed that its resistance suddenly disappeared. During the years that followed, great strides were made in understanding how superconductors work. Not only were superconductors proving themselves to be outstanding conductors, but they also had a secret power that wasn't known by anyone at the time. Kind of like how Clark Kent seems like an ordinary man at first, but really has all kinds of superpowers. Hey, are you talking about Superman? Did yeah. you know he has super strength, super speed, and x-ray vision? He's able to fly and defy gravity. He's not called Superman for no reason. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> kind of like how superconductors aren't called super for no reason either. Did you know two German physicists, Walter Meiser and Robert Oceanfield, discovered in 1933 that superconductors can defy gravity too? They called this anomaly the Meissner's effect. To help me understand more about the Meissner's effect, I contacted a college near me to see if anyone in the physics department could help me out. So I headed over to the University of Nevada, Las Vegas to speak with some experts. The Meissner effect is an effect that superconductors, when they become superconducting, and part of this process of becoming superconducting, they actually expel the magnetic field from the material. And, and so there's no magnetic field inside the material. Um, it's all been expelled. And, and this is what can lead to levitation and stuff like that. I mean, it, it has no magnetic field. So that's the Meissner effect. To illustrate what Mr. Lepp was discussing, let's imagine this little magnet was really a superconductor. This superconductor is made of yttrium barium copper oxide. It's a type 1 superconductor. What that means is because it's a type 1 superconductor, the transition from a normal state to a superconducting state happens almost instantly. Whereas a type 2 superconductor transitions to a superconducting state quite slowly and does something called quantum locking, which we'll get to later. A superconducting state is different from other material states, such as when water goes from a liquid to a solid. However, superconductors go from a solid to a solid. During this transition, you won't see any noticeable differences in shape or size but there's a lot going on beyond what the eye can see. This is a strong magnet, and our superconductor sits on top of it. Right now, our superconductor isn't behaving like a superconductor. 
This is because we haven't cooled the material down to its critical temperature. But when we do cool it down with liquid nitrogen, we see the superconducting effects taking place. The superconductor begins to levitate above the magnet. It can do this because, as Mr. Lepp mentioned, it is expelling the magnetic field within itself. Or, in other words, what do principals do when they have to deal with kids who are behaving badly? The principal will expel them. So the superconductor here is doing something similar. While the superconductor is expelling the magnetic field, it's as if the superconductor is then forcing the magnetic field away from the solid. This is what caused the levitation. During my meeting with Mr. Lepp, I also asked him about quantum locking. Quantum locking differs from the Meissner's effect, and like I mentioned before, it occurs in type 2 superconductors. Quantum locking is where a material has, um, it, it, they call them, type 2 superconductor materials have this naturally. They have places where the magnetic field actually goes through the material. And now when the material becomes superconducting, the magnetic field gets pinned in or locked to those positions. It's amazing how these materials that are superconductors have the ability to do the same thing, but in different ways. Quantum locking and the Meissner's effect both seem to produce the same levitating reaction. Yet, quantum locking still has distinctive differences. Here is our superconductor once more. This time, it's a type 2 superconductor. To bring it to its superconducting state, we must cool it to its critical temperature. Once that's done, if you place it above the magnet, it will stay in the exact place you put it. It can do this because of a little thing called flux pinning. You see, this is what happens when the superconductor is in its normal state. The magnetic field will penetrate it easily. But when the superconductor is cooled, it will try and expel most of the magnetic field. But in type 2 superconductors, tiny defects cause magnetic strands to become trapped inside. And while it's placed in a magnetic field, these magnetic strands will start moving around inside the superconductor. Remember how I said, for a superconductor to be defined as a superconductor, it must have no electrical resistance? Well, if these magnetic strands are moving around, that means this movement will cause the superconductor to lose energy. So the superconductor will lock these strands in place with what is called quantum flux tubes, so that doesn't happen. If we have a magnet, levitating above the superconductor, like we see here, you can actually pick up the magnet and because the superconductor is locked in place, you won't be able to separate the two until the superconductor warms up, of course. After learning all about how superconductors work, I'm sure you're thinking the same question I was after I learned all this. Why aren't superconductors used everywhere? I mean, they're so useful and they have so many amazing properties. Unfortunately, scientists have yet to find a high temperature superconductor. The problem with most superconductors today is although they prove to have amazing properties, the costs involved in cooling them down makes them very inefficient. Hopefully, this new kind of superconductor will be found soon. Many can't even imagine the possibilities and doors this kind of superconductor would open. Today, superconductors are already used in MRIs, maglev trains, and even particle accelerators. And Mr. Lepp agrees with me when I say that maybe one day we'll use superconductors to have our own hoverboards, just like in the movie Back to the Future.